Brussels Bytes, a podcast about technology, digital society and European policy. Brought to you by the Martin Center with Dimitar Lilkov. Hi, and thanks for joining. I'm Dimitar, and this is your favorite podcast on technology and European policy, coming from rainy Brussels. In our previous episode, we talked a lot about data, privacy, talked even about 5G and artificial intelligence. But today, I would like to open the conversation a bit and also focus on media and the European audiovisual sector. With today's guest, we'll talk about European media, policy, but also European series, and hopefully football. And we have the perfect guest for the job. I'm really happy to be joined by David Wilden, who leads Sky Media's policy positioning and advocacy, as well as government relations and industry engagement across Sky's European markets and European Union institutions. David, it's a pleasure to have you. Mitra, it's lovely to be here. David, you're based in London. How does Brussels feel? How does rainy EU Gotham City feel? Well, I've been working in Brussels for the best part of 20 years, so I'm quite familiar with the city and um, I rather like it. So I think I come here maybe once or twice a month um, uh, and the rest of the time I'm in some of our other European headquarters in uh, Milan and Munich and Dublin. Um, Sky is a pan-European organization, pan-European broadcaster. I think we are the largest commercial broadcaster in the European Union uh, with 24 million customers. So we have significant scale and we have significant scale in significant markets, uh, which gives us a quite unique perspective as to what is going on across the continent. Didn't you recently launch a new major studio here? We have. We have launched Sky Studios. Um, so if you think about Sky as having three pillars up till now, the UK and Ireland business, the German and Austrian business and the Italian business, we've launched Sky Studios as a fourth pillar stretching right across Europe. And it's going to be a very major studio. We've made a pledge that in the next five years, we're going to double the amount of money we invest in European original content. So it's a major opportunity. It's a major investment in Europe. Uh, and I think it's a sign of the confidence that we have of Europe as uh, a major cultural force uh, and a major um, focus point for businesses such as ours operating at scale. You mentioned European content, um, and I want to hold you, hold you on that. Mm. Um, Sky has been part of the production of several blockbuster series. Chernobyl, Das Boot, uh, Babylon Berlin. By the way, I recently finished Babylon Berlin. Great stuff. Very good. Um, in all these series, they tell very specific European narratives mm -hmm. set in the 20th century. Do you see a growing interest in European series? How can we actually even promote this type of content? Yes. I think, I think uh, Europe is a fantastic uh, cultural uh, pool, a place where stories are so compelling, where our history and our divergent cultures give us fantastic opportunity to create television programs that are marketable not just in our respective countries but but worldwide and some of those series that you just described we've sold in over a hundred countries uh, around the world um, Chernobyl for example has recently won uh, 10 Emmys mm. um, fantastic achievement Babylon Berlin um, was one of our most successful series not just in Germany but in some of the other markets and we really do see Europe as providing this fantastic store of storytelling and storytellers. And Sky Studios is going to tap into that. It's going to mine that rich history and use it to tell European stories. And the important thing to understand here is that we, as, our, as, a, as a European business, feel like we have got a competitive advantage in telling those stories. It gives us something that some of the major Euro, uh, US uh, content creators don't have deep roots in our cultural history. But wait a tick. You recently got, I think last year maybe, you got bought by a new parent company, Comcast, mm -hmm. which is American. Mm -hmm. What does this mean for content creation and for the general direction of the company if your parent company is American? Well, actually, 
It's a fantastic opportunity for us. Comcast paid uh, top dollar, literally, mm. uh, for Sky, um, because they saw in Sky something that gave them uh, a real scale in Europe, in a market that they didn't have scale before. Now, Comcast also own NBC Universal, mm. one of the major Hollywood studios and uh, TV companies. So the opportunity to be part of that and to add to it from a European perspective, but also leverage it for our consumers in all of our markets is huge. And I have to say, a year in, um, ownership by Comcast feels uh, like we've come home. Uh, they're a company that understands both content creation through the ownership of NBC Universal, but also TV distribution as America's largest cable company. So the two sides of Sky, if you like, are represented by Comcast. Uh, and they have, I think, some major ambitions for us, and they are supporting us in delivering that. And I think, you know, if you look at Sky Studios, an announcement uh, that we made under their ownership, they're absolutely behind that opportunity. So you're not afraid that Sky's freedom will be limited? No, I think quite the opposite. I think it gives us even greater mm -hmm. freedom. It gives us access to uh, global talent. It gives us access to deeper pools of capital. It gives us access to fantastic technology. And I think we're going to be in a, in a fairly unique position. Sky was founded in Britain. Mm -hmm. It's become pan-European. So half our customers now are outside of the United Kingdom. And we're owned by uh, a US parent. Three big trading blocks in a post-Brexit world. I think it'll give us uh, an insight, uh, an opportunity to, to bring some of the best from all of those markets and hopefully act as somewhat of a bridge between them, given that Brexit has been such a painful process. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, some of the, um, the scars that that's caused will heal once, once uh, uh, negotiations are concluded. Uh, and we can all get on to building a more prosperous Europe together. And maybe this is a great opportunity for Europe to sell its stories better, right? We, we, we hear I this criticism so. all the time that Europe doesn't sell its story, doesn't sell its content, doesn't sell its even popular culture the way that the Americans do. I mean, I think that's a, a, a slightly um, uh, self-critical mm. uh, perspective, if I might say so. I think Europe has produced some of the, the greatest stories in history and some of the best TV and, and films. It's certainly true that Hollywood has exploited a lot of that. But Hollywood has also invested heavily in Europe and makes a lot of films here. But we've certainly seen huge success from some of our TV series. The TV series which are very culturally specific. So you look, for example, in Italy at Gomorrah, four seasons of a uh, TV series about the Neapolitan Mafia, mm. which you would have thought would be only very specific to, to, to Italy and to that market, but actually has found resonance right across Europe and sold into uh, over 100 markets. Um, you look at stories like um, The Young Pope, and indeed, The New Pope, which is the next series, made by Paolo Sarantino, an Oscar-winning uh, director, which uses European cultural references to tell a global story. I think, actually, we do underplay the significance of Europe's ability to, to tell stories and to do that well. And actually, our uh, production community, the talent that exists here, the writers, the actors, the TV producers, is second to none, and therefore a huge opportunity for us, which is, again, why we've been taking this bold move to, to invest in Sky Studios. Great. Let's let's focus on, on on content and engaging with with audiences. And I have something in mind. Some of the bigger um, on-demand services have been criticized. And here, okay, I'll, I'll be honest. Talk, talking about Netflix, platforms like Netflix have been criticized that they've been developing specific designs or specific inbuilt nudges in in their software, so they can keep viewers engaged, so they can keep users. Um, staying hooked, basically. And I, I'll give you a great example. Um, a couple of months ago on this podcast, we had a, a guest member from the European Parliament 
who met with representatives from Silicon Valley. And he, he spoke with people who are engaged in this industry, uh, on-demand services, video platforms. And they were talking about different problems and, and different issues. And one of them told him, one of my biggest problems is that people sleep and that I can't engage them with my content 24 seven. So where is the fine line between positively engaging with people and actually potentially harming them by binge watching? I think that the harm caused by binge watching in in the grand scheme of things Mm. is a, a, a pretty low down the order. I mean, given some of the issues that we see in the social media world. Mm. Look, I think you've got to think about this in in a few different ways. First of all, platforms like ours are curated platforms. We take the best content from our local markets and around the world, and we present it to customers in a way that they find easiest to access, most compelling with the best service. Netflix is no different in that respect. Um, And the right technology, the right platforms to do that um, is is what the name of the game is. I, I see that as a very different kind of issue um, when you think about how you curate content that you are responsible for to some of the problems that are thrown up by social media platforms where it's quite clear that curation is going on but it's also clear there is a lack of responsibility and opacity over the way that they do it and some of the harms caused by user-generated content which is very different from the editorialized content that we provide um, is, is a much bigger issue than, frankly, whether people get hooked on a TV series or not. You mentioned platform liability in a way and online harms in social media. Should online social media platforms be liable for their content? This is one of the biggest issues right now. It's a huge issue, and I've watched the hearings with great interest, uh, and uh, in particular the references to the Digital Services Act, uh, an interesting choice of, of uh, legislative moniker, by the way. An, an act is not something that we've seen in Europe before. Um, j- just to, to step back a little bit and mm. give you our perspective as a, as a TV business and an online audiovisual distributor, w- what we see increasingly is the curated and regulated content that we serve to our customers in their homes, appearing alongside on the same platform, a plethora of unregulated content from the online world. And therefore, what you see with our customers is increasing confusion about what has been through a regulated process and what hasn't, and where about responsibility lies for that content. The the dividing lines are increasingly blurred. Then, of course, we're a major advertiser. Online, we provide, uh, we we buy advertising across lots of different platforms. And we increasingly find it very hard to ensure that our brand and our content and our services are not appearing alongside content which is socially harmful. And we don't get from the platforms the kind of assurances that we need as a significant spender on their services that they're doing enough to protect our brand and to protect our customers. And then finally, we're a major internet service provider in the UK, in Ireland, and soon to launch as a broadband provider in Italy. And we provide tools for customers to keep themselves online, uh, safe online, parental controls, Broadband Shield in the UK was the first of the parental controls to be turned on automatically for customers. And what we see there is increasing demand from our customers to have some form of um, known protection from what they are seeing online, the ability to keep their homes and their children, their families safe. So from all three perspectives, we see an online world which is increasingly blurring the lines, and it does feel like uh, Brussels and the EU is going to start to think seriously about that, as we've already seen happening in some of the markets that we operate in, like Germany and the UK. So you think that the mood is shifting? Because as as you say, there is demand from the users. Now in 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 the commissioner hearings, we have the Digital Services Act upcoming. 
do you think that there is a shift when we talk about the, the, these, these issues? I think there is a shift. I mean, I, 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 would, I think you'd be hard pressed, even if you're the most vocal defender of online platforms, to say that there hasn't been a shift and that there isn't a growing awareness of what is uh, a, a societal wide concern about online harms. I would say even more than that, there is a, a growing realization that we have thus far, since the e-commerce directive was put in place 20 years ago, we have thus far allowed that segment of our economy, uh, of our technology uh, ecosystem, to mark its own homework. Mm -hmm. There's been no framework that oversees the policies that these companies put in place. So self-regulation, uh, self yes or no? I, I think the days of self-regulation, frankly, are over. That, that is ultimately what this debate is about. Uh, by the way, I'm certainly not throwing stones and accusing them of not taking some responsibility. They have tried to take some responsibility. The problem is there is no oversight of that responsibility. There is no oversight of the actions that they're taking. There's no objective measurement. Now, the world that I come from, that's what we have had for decades, almost since the birth of television. Back in the 1930s, there was regulatory oversight, and we were subject to a set of rules which we have to follow, which were designed to keep society safe and to protect viewers and customers. And I think those days of saying, yes, they can state mm -hmm. what they're doing and allow themselves to mark their own homework and tell us whether or not they think they've, been, they've done the right thing. I think those days are coming to an end. The question of how that framework evolves and what is put in place is obviously the subject of fierce debate. And we're certainly, I think, going to see over the next few years um, uh, in, this, in this town in particular, um, some pretty, I think, some, some pretty lively um, uh, conversations and uh, quite a few um, uh, euros and dollars spent trying to influence the outcome. By the way, on this topic, because I also follow it quite closely, one of the most active proponents for, for regulation, for actual action in this domain, has been the United Kingdom. Brexit or not, the UK has been engaged in this topic. Two examples spring to mind. First of all, the UK Electoral Commission, for example, in the last decade has been saying during election campaigns, it's a digital wild west when it comes to digital advertisement, sponsoring. It, it's, it's, we have to change the rules. And secondly, um, a very interesting white paper came from the UK recently on, on online harms, which focuses on the issues you, you, just, you just raised and also suggests a number of measures in which companies should be more liable in the protection of, of, of their users and especially kids. Can you update us a bit on the UK online harms uh, white paper? Yes, actually, shall I? Let's let's take those two things. Okay. The, the point about elections is really interesting because I was looking uh, online just this morning mm. at the response that Facebook made to an accusation from Elizabeth Warren, who by some accounts is the leading Democrat contender in the US presidential race, where she had um, alleged that Facebook didn't take responsibility for untruths in some of President Trump's advertising. Now that's by the by whether you think they were untrue or not, but Facebook's response was we shouldn't be the determinant of what's acceptable here. Just like broadcasters, there needs to be um, some outside verification. I think the quote is they do not want to see themselves as arbiters, as arbiters. Of, of truth. Right? A, a, yeah. Absolutely, arbiters yeah. of truth. Yeah. Now, that's very interesting, yeah. right? That seems to me to be a explicit acceptance that there needs to be some external arbiter of what is acceptable in terms of election and political advertising. That's a fundamental change, actually, from where they've been. So I think we need to watch this space very closely. The UK situation is really interesting. The UK government published a white paper uh, in the summer, uh, uh, online harms white paper, and actually announced 
yesterday in the Queen's speech that it would be publishing some draft legislation in the next session of Parliament, um, which would then be open for consultation. Um, and what the UK is doing, I think, is very interesting because I suspect it's going to become a bit of a template for the conversations here and elsewhere. Because what the UK is saying is not that we think every piece of content should be subject to some kind of external regulation, but that the policies and processes that the online user-generated social media companies put in place need to have uh, an objective regulatory framework. So it's the subjecting the policies and processes to oversight rather than the individual pieces of content. And that's something that we've certainly argued for for a while. We published um, a think paper uh, last year which proposed something quite similar. Uh, and it seems to me that that is, if you like, the beginning of a way forward here where you're not attempting to say that every piece of content that a user posts should be subject to regulatory oversight. That would clearly, in the social media world, be impossible. But that the policies and processes that the companies put in place to protect their users from harm do need some external oversight. Uh, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if that doesn't become the kind of core debate around the Digital Services Act in due course. But these companies are clinging to the fact that they're protecting free speech. I, I think Twitter, I mean, let's let's add Twitter on this as well. Uh, Twitter CEO uh, said that uh, Twitter is the free speech wing of the free speech party, right? How, how do you see this dynamic? Got to be very careful with free speech, yeah. clearly. Uh, but, but you've also got to be very careful not to weaponize free speech. Mm. Um, you know, we saw that in the debate over the copyright directive in the current commission mandate, um, where free speech was utilized, if you like, as a means to say that platforms had no responsibility to ensure that copyrighted protected content wasn't uploaded. Now, the irony of all of this is that some of the platforms that were the biggest funders of campaign groups going on about free speech were also ones that already have systems in place to ensure that mm. copyrighted content doesn't arrive on their platforms. The question really is not how do we protect free speech, but what are the rules that govern free speech? At the moment, we've effectively privatized the decisions over free speech to these online platforms. It's not that every piece of content that you want to post, however extreme, appears on their platforms. It doesn't. They, in fact, they boast about the measures they take put in place to stop that from happening. The point isn't that free speech isn't a crucial area, an issue. The point is who ultimately bears the oversight and the responsibility for ensuring that free speech isn't abused. And at the moment, the platforms themselves take that responsibility. And, and they have no choice but to take that responsibility because in many ways the legal framework requires them to do it. I think what I'm saying and where I see the debate going is that there seems to be an acceptance that, uh, that that's no longer the right way to go. And indeed, I would hope that many of them, as you referring back to that Elizabeth Warren mm. example earlier, many of them are beginning to realize that that isn't a sustainable situation any longer. And we should not weaponize free speech. And I mean, I, yeah, I, I think it's really, it's, you know, free speech existed long before the internet. Mm -hmm. And free speech as a concept is one that we all hold to dearly. It's part of the, uh, it's part of our European society. It's part of our democratic system. It's absolutely critical. But free speech isn't something that is absolute. And free speech comes with responsibility. And especially after we, we, we see what weaponizing free speech leads in terms of disinformation and uh, attack on the integrity of our democratic systems and so on and so forth. But I, I just want to pause here and take a, take a step back because, I mean, the UK, as we see, is taking a 
a very important step in a specific direction and on a number of important, crucial topics for European security, for European economy, for European society, we, we that's my personal opinion, we, we need the UK. But Brexit looms. How does Brexit impact the future of your work? And how will Brexit impact all of these topics, issues and policies we, we, we've touched upon in the last 10, 20 minutes? Yes, well, uh, that in many ways is the great unknown. Um, for us as a business in particular, it's going to be an interesting um, challenge to navigate. As I say, half of our customers are outside of the UK uh, in European Union member states. And I fully expect as this company continues to grow, as we have some great ambitions to do, that even more greater proportion of our customers will be outside of the UK going forwards. Um, so how we navigate that new world and how uh, we learn lessons from the UK's position outside of the EU, possibly, if it happens, um, is going to be very interesting. Um, but you know what? We've got to get through this. Um, there is a de high degree of Brexit fatigue setting in in the UK. In fact, um, to let you into a, um, an advanced uh, announcement, uh, this afternoon we are announcing that Sky News will have a pop-up channel uh, in the UK which will be branded Brexit free. Because I, frankly, an awful lot of people are really quite tired <laughs> of going on and on about it. Um, so, uh, you know, I talk think... Up, talk about uh, consumer demand. Yeah, let's talk about anything <laughs> other than Brexit. Maybe we can talk about the football. Um, uh, but yes, uh, so that's a... That, that we, clearly, navigating that world is going to be an interesting challenge. I'm, you know, part of me and... I know some of the audience listening to this in Brussels are going to hate me from saying this, but part of me is sort of secretly looking forward to it because it's another challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a change. And I, I do think, if I might say so, that sometimes we in the EU, you know, we get a bit complacent sometimes and we are unwilling to learn lessons from outside of our bubble. And the one thing that Brexit will bring is something on the outside, but fairly a, a close. Ki a kick in the bum. Uh, no, let's not phrase it like that. Let's look at it more. <laughs> I'm trying to look at this positively <laughs> as best I can, um, because I think we have to be positive. Um, so let's just cross fingers. Um, uh, some listeners might like to know that my, my wife is a, is a member of parliament and is legislating on this. Um, and uh, she is uh, looking forward to getting this over and done with, not least for her own sanity and her own family life. <laughs> Um, you're British, I'm Bulgarian, and I think our, ah, na our, our nations yes. are experts in politics and football. So maybe we can, we can, uh, we can turn to football. You're, you're an avid football fan. I am. Um, Sky Sports has recently started putting highlights of Premiership games, and I'm saying this because I follow this also closely. You've started putting um, Premier League highlights on YouTube. Yes. Is this a one-off bonus to engage with a younger younger audience, or is is this does this signal a, a shift that you'll be engaging more with different types of platforms and sharing your content on, let's say, YouTube? Or yes, I look. I think it's the latter. I think that looking for where audiences are is the most important thing that we can do when we've um, spent and invested a lot of money in the in the rights to um, to to leagues in all of our markets. And we know that increasingly people are, are you know, migrating to online platforms to watch audiovisual content. Um, then it, it, it seems like an obvious place to go. Um, it, it is what we've done on YouTube is a, is a trial. We'll evaluate it and see whether or not it it, it makes sense to do more. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, we've been distributing content online since 2006. Uh, so we're very used to and experienced in, in doing this. Um, now TV, which is our internet service in, in the UK and, and, and Italy, um, is one of the most used um, internet service uh, television platforms um, in Europe and you know, has been incredibly successful in making streamed content available to people and, and able to access sport in a different way without um, uh, monthly contracts. But buying passes for the games you want to watch Make over the flexible. weekend, making it more flexible. And so we've been evolving to meet new demand for a long time. Um, and I've no doubt that that will continue. Um, and of course, football is really important to us, but you know, fewer than half of our customers actually take sport now. So we're a much broader business. We don't depend upon football. Um, but would you be 
able to compete in a very, very toughly populated and very competitive space, talking about streaming. Yes. Let's say Amazon, for example. Well, Amazon have bought the rights to some games in the UK mm-hmm. um, uh, this Christmas, uh, and um, we'll see how that, how that goes for them. Um, but, you know, what you've got to see is that online is simply another means of distribution. We've, been, we've always been distribution agnostic. You know, we, we moved away from being a satellite TV company a long, long time ago. We distribute an awful lot on terrestrial television. We distribute an awful lot online. And we're very happy to make sure that our content is where customers want it. That does bring me, though, to one key thing, actually, which has been a big debate in Brussels over the years, mm. which is the availability of audiovisual content across borders. And, um, you know, Painful the, topic. The, yeah, years ago. the issue of territoriality and yeah. geoblocking is never far from the debate here. Look, I would say this, going back to the very first question you asked about Europe and our cultural uh, depth and diversity, the one thing that has made us like that is because we do have differences. And that does mean that content is valued very differently in different markets. So, you know, one piece of TV content, whether it's sport or premium scripted drama, is going to be valued very differently in different markets. And therefore, the economics of how we put that content together depends upon our ability to monetize it effectively across all the European markets. And if you start to chip away at, erode that ability to sell it differently, different platforms, different windows, different monetization packages in the different markets, you will fundamentally weaken the ability to invest in European content. And, you know, all that will do is play into the hands of the global Silicon Valley, Mm. West Coast based studios um, who wish to produce global content and own the rights globally, and aren't interested in the kind of investments that we want to make in European stories. So I've said this to the Commission many times, I've talked to to MEPs about it many times, we've got to be very careful about this whole area, because actually what it does at the moment is underpin the strength of our audiovisual sector and of our cultural difference and our storytelling capability and we mustn't undermine that as a strategic priority for I European believe it's culture, str- audiovisual service. yes it's a strategic priority yeah. and we should see it as that and look the single market is of course it's important that people have that ability to um, to access goods and services in Europe uh, uh, wh- wherever they are but there are very different types of services and goods in the single market. And we have to recognize that audiovisual is a very special, very different type of product, very different type of service. And I think it's taken an awful lot of energy and effort from our sector that every time this debate comes around, we feel like we've got to go through it all over again to explain why it's so important that we sustain a structure that allows us to continue to make the investments. I'm sure we can keep on going with this amazing conversation at least for one more hour, but we have to close. And I'm really tempted to ask you a cheeky question. Mm. You are a policy... Arsenal or Man United for the uh, title? I'm Man United, uh, you're Arsenal. Yeah, I think like we <laughs> were saying earlier that we're, we're that, fighting right? for fifth place, which is a little bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go into that. It's very painful at the moment. Um, you were a policy advisor in the House of Commons in the 90s. I was. Maastricht Treaty. Oh. I was there. You were there. Oh, yes. I well remember it. How did political life change in the last two decades in Westminster? And and I'm asking this because, look, Westminster and British politics have been a a template for for politics, for young democracies, for young aspiring democracies globally. And and now we have this change in in British politics. We have this, I don't know, fudge. What, What happened in the last couple of years? Well, what happened in the last couple of years was the Brexit vote. Sure, but, yeah. um, that, more than anything, has has um, upended some of the certainties it's only that we're that. used to. Is it only that? No, it's not only that. Look, I don't think that we're that different from what's happening around the world. Um, you know, politics is becoming um, less tribal. People people no longer vote in the traditional tribes that they're used to. Mm. They are they treat politics like a consumer. They are much more prepared to pick and choose what they want, what political uh, 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 parties they want, what political leaders they want. Um, But whilst people have evolved like that, our political and democratic systems haven't. 
and in particular, what we're seeing in the UK is our political parties are really no longer able to represent the range of views that people out there have. Now, whether or not we get through Brexit, things might revert back to normal, I don't know. The only thing I would say, I'm sort of, I've lived through a few political crises um, in my 25-year career. Uh, as I say, I came into working in the British Parliament in 1992 and was there during the big votes on Maastricht when John Major lost his majority and the House of Commons was equally deadlocked. Um, and yes, what's happening with Brexit is a, 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 another scale, but political dramas and crises do come and go. I would say that we've all got to try to think and lift our heads above the day-to-day -day drama that we're facing at the moment and think big, think about what's going on globally. You know, we'd, where do we see properly argued in our democratic institutions how the rise of China and the geopolitical positioning that's going to go on between China, the US and Europe and Russia is going to be tackled in future. You know, we have a rising superpower that is going to change everything, that's going to want to do global politics on their terms. And I think that we, as a, as a body politic, are singularly ill-equipped to be dealing with that. And the latest drama is kind of just a little bit of, um, of, of, of dust in the wind compared with some of those big tectonic continental shifts. I think that the last couple of sentences should be broadcasted in the halls of Westminster, to be honest, and different Indeed. politicians have to be have to tune into that as well. David, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining Brussels Bytes. Um, join us next month when we'll be talking about facial recognition, artificial intelligence, and all of those questions, all those dystopian questions which keep you up at night. Thank you, Dimitri. That was today's episode of Brussels Bites. 